the world witnessed a stunning display of power and precision when Ship 25 and Booster 9 soared into the sky with 33 Raptor 2 engines last weekend. But the real star of the show was the colossal Mechazilla, the robotic arm that made it all possible. Before its crucial role in the historic flight, Mechazilla had performed complex tasks, lifting and lowering Ship 25 six times with remarkable accuracy. Its vital contributions to SpaceX's groundbreaking achievement are undeniable. That's why SpaceX is replicating this beast at Starbase Texas to prepare for bigger and bolder missions in the future. In today's episode of Great SpaceX, we'll tell you everything you need to know about this amazing structure. The Starbase Orbital Launch Tower, also known as Mechazilla, stood tall and proud at the Starbase launch pad after the latest Starship orbital flight attempt. Despite the fiery landing of the Starship, Mechazilla suffered minimal damage and was undergoing post-launch inspections. The catching arm, which is designed to catch the Starship and the Super Heavy Booster in mid-air, looked ready for action. The only minor problem was the misalignment of the quick disconnect arm, which connects the Starship to the ground support equipment. This issue will likely be addressed soon. There are two main hypotheses for why the quick disconnect arm was not in its expected position. One is that the arm detached too late from the ship, disrupting the delicate timing of the separation maneuver. The other is that the arm was subjected to excessive stresses from the 33 Raptor engines of the Super Heavy Booster, which generated immense thrust during launch. A closer look at the photos reveals some worrying signs at the hydraulic piston connection point of the quick disconnect arm. This is where the arm attaches to the ship, and it should have two pistons on each side. However, one of them seems to be missing, possibly broken off by the powerful exhaust plume of Booster 9's engines. The loss of this piston could have contributed to the misalignment of the arm. Such anomalies are not trivial in the field of space exploration, where every detail matters. SpaceX will need to investigate and resolve this issue before attempting another Starship flight. In fact, SpaceX performed a post-launch inspection of the QD to determine the cause and extent of the deviation. Fortunately, the deviation did not damage any critical parts of the QD, such as cables or fuel lines. This indicates that the electronic engine technology at the front end of the QD is working well. SpaceX will continue to fine-tune the QD and implement any necessary measures to prevent similar deviations in the future. This is undoubtedly a remarkable achievement for SpaceX's Stage Zero, both in terms of its own progress since seven months ago and in terms of its comparison with the NASA SLS launch pad. The latter, which is part of NASA's Artemis mission to the moon, suffered significant damage during its first launch in 2022, such as blown off elevator doors and scorched grass. Moreover, the NASA SLS launch tower had a staggering cost of over a billion US dollars, while the SpaceX Mechazilla launch towers and the oil rig launch towers are estimated to cost less than a hundred million dollars each. With all those benefits, SpaceX has now begun building a second launch tower at Starbase. Starbase is preparing for a historic launch of Starship, the reusable rocket that SpaceX hopes will take humans to Mars one day. As part of the preparations, SpaceX has been building a second orbital launch tower to support the launch operations. The first piece of the second OLT arrived at Starbase four days after the launch, followed by the second and third pieces the next day. These pieces were shipped from Florida, where SpaceX had been working on a third OLT after completing two others. It's unclear if the entire third OLT will be transferred to Starbase or if some parts will remain in Florida. SpaceX still has a lot of work to do before the second OLT is ready, but the company is aiming for an ambitious schedule in 2024. By then, Starbase could have two fully functional OLTs and two stacked Starships ready to launch. This would be an amazing sight to witness and a testament to SpaceX's innovation and vision. The last time Starship flew was on April 20th. Musk said then that SpaceX would launch Starship again in six to eight weeks 
weeks. It ended up taking much longer than that for the vehicle to get off the ground, of course. The FAA didn't grant a launch license until the 15th of November after it had wrapped up an investigation into the explosion and conducted a safety review as well as an environmental assessment. It's unclear when the agency's investigation into Saturday's flight will end. It just got underway after all. But given the progress SpaceX made with Flight 2 compared to Flight 1, it'd be surprising if there's another 7-month gap between Starship liftoffs. SpaceX certainly seems to be gearing up for an increased test flight cadence. There are three ships in final production in the Starbase High Bay, as can be seen from the highway, Musk said in a post Sunday on X.com. The future of space exploration is bright. Putting Starship aside for the moment, the next notable flight will be the first launch of the Vulcan Centaur rocket. ULA's CERT-1 mission, which uses the Centaur upper stage, is getting ready for launch at Cape Canaveral. The stage arrived there on November 13th and is now undergoing preparations before being attached to the Vulcan booster. After the integration, ULA will conduct another wet dress rehearsal to test both stages with propellants and a simulated countdown. Then we will be standing by and ready to encapsulate and then integrate our spacecraft, said Tori Bruno, CEO of ULA. The spacecraft consists of Astrobotics Peregrine Lunar Lander, which carries payloads from NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services, or CLPS, program and other customers. There's also a Celestis payload that will stay with the Centaur stage. Peregrine's launch windows are determined by its landing site conditions and its need to maintain contact with NASA's Deep Space Network. The first launch opportunity is on December 24th at 1.49 a.m. Eastern. If the window is missed, there are two more on December 25th and 26th. ULA did not reveal the exact times of those windows in the call, but NASA's Joel Kearns said in a November 14th presentation about the CLIPS program that they are at 1.53 a.m. Eastern on December 25th and 2.08 a.m. Eastern on December 26th. All three windows would lead to a landing around 3.30 a.m. Eastern, January 25th. Bruno said preparations are on schedule to support that launch opportunity. We're actually pacing a couple of days ahead of that, he said. Fingers crossed. Besides sending Peregrine on its way to the moon, ULA will test this upgraded version of the Centaur called Centaur 5. There will be additional maneuvers performed just to give us an opportunity to exercise the Centaur 5. Really verify, but mostly learn about its quirks as we go through its paces in preparation for missions that'll come later. A success on CERT-1 would allow the second Vulcan mission, CERT-2, to launch in the first or second quarter of 2024, Bruno said. It'll carry the first Dream Chaser spacecraft for Sierra Space. The rest of the manifest for 2024 is still being coordinated, but he noted that missions for Amazon's Project Kuiper in 2024 will use the Atlas V. ULA plans to ramp up the Vulcan launch rate to twice a month by the end of 2025, as it works to fly off a backlog of 70 launches that Bruno said is pretty even between government and commercial customers. While he discussed details about the future of Vulcan, he was more circumspect about the company's future. He said in a Bloomberg interview in October that the company, a joint venture of Boeing and Lockheed Martin, could be an attractive acquisition target. If I were buying a space business, I'd go look at ULA, he said then. Another report on November 13th by Ars Technica said three companies, including Blue Origin, are finalists to acquire the company. I could never talk about or even speculate about the merger or acquisition situation, Bruno said in a call about a potential sale of ULA. I did say that ULA is in great shape after our transformation and our full, how many years long, presence in the commercial marketplace. Well, folks, that's about it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. And if you want to support our channel even further, you can hop on over to our Patreon through the link in the description below. Sign up and become a patron today to gain access to exclusive content. Sounds exciting, right? In any case, we still appreciate your generosity and your passion for space exploration. As always, this is Kevin from Great SpaceX, and until next time, keep looking up.